Number one. When I was 16 years old, my dad started telling me about the middle of the night phone calls. The caller would get my dad on the line, ask for me, and when he didn't get me, he would start telling my dad the rudest, most vile things about me. I didn't know who was calling or why, and I never woke up when the phone rang. I wish I could sleep like that now, so I never spoke with this guy. Fast forward, and I'm 22, fresh out of the military and landed at home for a year while I start college, get a job, and save money. This time I hear the phone ring in the middle of the night. Dad mentions the phone calls tapered off while I was away, which was four years, but have started again. One day, I'm at home and I get a phone call around noon. Some guy, I don't recognize his voice, asks for me, and I say, speaking. He proceeds to ask if I remember doing all sorts of sexual acts and describes some stuff before I hang up. I am rattled because I always thought if I could hear his voice I would know who it was. I called the police who came out to take my statement. This was just a year or so before caller ID became available in my city. They told me how to get the call traced next time, gave me a case number. I moved into my own apartment about a year later, got my name listed in the phone book before the internet. This was a big deal. One day, a few months after I moved in, I have a message on my answering machine. Hello. I think you know who this is. Still, click. I promptly asked for an unlisted number, and I was one of the first people to get residential caller ID in the city of Seattle, but as far as I know, he never called again. Number 2 so this just happened. A bit of background of the last 25 minutes. I just got home from a reasonably big night. It's 4.30am and stinking hot in this part of Australia right now. I walked in the door and opened the fridge and was so happy to find three icy cold beers in the fridge. I take two of them and walk upstairs to bed to read and drink myself into a boozy sleep first issue. The beers are not twist tops, they need a bottle opener. And after some sloppy drunken attempts at using the handle of the draw off my bedside table, I head back downstairs to use an actual bottle opener. I turn on the kitchen lights, which are so bright that they make the space behind my eyes burn. I squint around to find the bottle opener, which I can't find so I use the solid edge of a large kitchen knife. It's a risky choice, but the bottle cap is now off the beer and I'm happy. I turn off the alien blinding kitchen light and go to head upstairs, but something through the front window of my house that looks onto the street catches my eye. I stop at the bottom of the stairs and all the hairs on the back of my neck and arms stand up. I turn my head slowly, and my eyes and brain are trying to make sense of what I'm actually looking at. It looks like a rain-drenched woman in a fancy white dress gazing at me through the window. Oh, fuck. It actually is. I pause and take the longest inhale of my life. She's glaring at me like she hates me. She has mascara running down her face and she is drenched from the rain. Her arms are extended and she's leaning her head towards me like her body language was trying to say, Look at me. Look at what you've done. 
I'm shitting bricks. But the rational side of my brain kicks in and I think, Shit, is she okay? Does she need help? I slowly walk over to the window, her gaze still locked onto mine. We are now literally within one meter of each other. I state loudly through the glass. Are you okay? Do you need help? Is anyone with you? Then it dawns on me. My gate is locked, and there is an eight foot high fence which is very difficult to climb. How did she get in? She doesn't respond to my inquiry. She just keeps that hateful look in her eyes. We stood there for about another 30 seconds. I was looking around nervously, trying to make sense of this, and she was just glaring into my soul. And then she finally opened her mouth as if to say something, finally. But it wasn't words that came out of her mouth. It was an insanely high-pitched meow. And then she starts clawing at the window with her novelty-sized fingernails. What. The. Fuck. I'm frozen. I don't know what to do. She's clearly not very well. Not very well at all. Then in the background behind the fence, I see another woman, 20-something, dressed in a short black club dress with a glow of her phone lighting up her face. She sees the woman in white at my window and yells, Michelle, you pissed bitch, that's the wrong fucking house. The rain-soaked nightmare cat woman's eyes go from I hate you and want you to die to Oh my god, I'm so embarrassed. And she runs over to the fence and impressively army commando flings herself over it. I can then hear a group of ladies pissing themselves laughing, saying how Jason's house is number 25, not 23, you fucking idiot. That poor guy is probably going to call the cops now. All I know is that I am so happy that I was on the receiving end of a misdirected prank and I didn't have to be killed by a well-dressed hybrid cat demon woman. And now, I have to go back down to the kitchen to open my other beer. But I'm still too afraid. Number 3 When I was 18 years old, I worked as a lifeguard in Toronto, Canada. I had been doing this job for two years and worked a lot at different pools. I had picked up the shift that was every Friday night, 6.30pm to 10pm during the winter season, also known as the loser shift for people who don't have anything fun to do on Friday nights. In early December, I was the only one left in the pool building on my Friday night shift at about 10.30pm. The pool building is attached to a main community center that has an ice rink and a gym in it, but the pool building has a completely different entrance and parking lot than the community center. Anyway, I was about to lock up and drop the key off at the main building when I saw a girl waiting outside in the parking lot. She was about 10 years old, and I recognized her as one of the people who came for free swim during my shift. I was just about to ask her if she wanted to come wait inside, because it was freezing outside, when the phone rang. I went back into the staff office to answer the call, and after I was done, the girl was gone. I assumed her parents had come to pick her up for something logical. I then grabbed my stuff, turned the lights off, and locked the door to drop the key off and then walk home. I was walking across the parking lot for about 15 meters when I heard a faint muffled scream. I turned around quickly 
and saw a truck idling at the far end of the parking lot. It was kind of far away, and I had to squint my eyes to see what was going on. To my horror, I realized a man was bent over and struggling to get something into his truck. I moved a little closer towards the truck and saw that the man was wearing all black and had a scarf covering half his face. Then I saw a girl's arm trying to hold the trunk open while the man was trying to shut it. She had her legs sticking out of the trunk too, kicking and also holding the trunk door open. I recognized her as the girl that was waiting outside before. I noticed her bright pink winter jacket. Two seconds after I realized what was going on, I started panicking and looking for my phone in my bag. The parking lot was completely empty other than that one truck. It was dimly lit and the ground was very icy. I looked up once I found my phone at the bottom of my bag. The man stopped struggling to get the girl into the trunk and turned to face me. As quickly as I possibly could, I turned around and started running back towards the pool door. I looked over my shoulder while I was cautiously running, trying not to slip on the ice. He was charging towards me. I was about ten meters away from the door and he had gotten significantly closer to me. I started screaming, but it was hard to scream while running. I got to the door and struggled to get the keys out of my coat pocket. He was about five meters away when I unlocked the door and shut it behind me, then locked it. I called the cops on my phone and told the operator what was happening, and she said the police were on their way. It was terrifying to watch the man come right up at the door and try to open it, looking at me through the glass window at the top of the door. He banged on it and was yelling at me. I couldn't really hear what he was saying though. I then gave him the finger and then I think he realized that I was on the phone and then he took off. It was horrifying to be behind the building door and not being able to see what was going on with the truck and the girl. I heard sirens pull into the parking lot about five long minutes after he left. I then felt that it was safe to open the door and walk outside. When I got outside, the girl was running towards the police cars, and the truck was nowhere in sight. Turns out that he lured her to his truck, not really sure how, and then tried to abduct her. Once he stopped banging on the pole door, he ran back to his car, threw the girl out of the trunk, then sped out of the parking lot to never be seen again. I gave the police my statement, and as far as I know, he was never caught. Number 4 This took place after I graduated high school and moved away from my family. I moved up to Alaska again, and I say again because I lived there before and attended college there. Very conveniently, my mother had been renting out her old house instead of selling it. I say conveniently because the long-standing residents had moved away, and therefore I was awarded the old house. I had to work quite a bit to keep up the payments, but my mother pitched in, thankfully. At the beginning of this story, I should make you aware that I had recently broken up with a girl who had been staying with me in the old house I was renting through my mother, and this breakup was unclean and dysfunctional, much like the relationship itself was. So it was winter break which means I would be spending more time inside than I normally would. It was somewhat lonely in the house, being without a stable girlfriend then. Also, there's no neighbors really to speak of, as the house was an extremely wooded region a few miles out of town. One late afternoon, soon after I thought the whole breakup predicament had come to a close, I was made quite aware that it wasn't. 
My cell phone began ringing and ringing from an unknown number. Cliché, I know. And I decided to pick up. It was, of course, my ex. She began telling me about how great her new boyfriend is and how horrible I was and am. The sort of talk that you can almost smell the booze off the caller's breath from miles away. I actually listened until she decided to hand the phone to her boyfriend, where he was instead sounding oddly threatening, and I decided to hang up in the most polite manner possible with a fuck you and a have a nice day. Days later, again with my mind beginning to forget, only this time about the most certainly drunk phone call, I'm laying on the living room couch watching some TV. While laying there, I notice something quite unsettling. A person standing in the window behind me. How did I notice this, you ask? The reflection from the TV screen is how. I didn't move. Not an inch. I had no gun. I had no knife. I had nothing but my wit and my fists. I just lay there watching the reflection. Eventually, it moved away from the window. That normally wouldn't spook me, but I was taking into account that, one, the house was nowhere near another, so that's a red flag, and two, if someone was just wanting to talk, they'd knock, and three, I was most certain it was that boyfriend of hers. Nothing became of that situation, but similar situations continued, such as a car pulling into the driveway and no one getting out and leaving inconspicuously. This was worrisome at the least, but I didn't suspect a true threat. A few days later, I'm laying in bed at night. It was very late and I was getting ready to sleep. I get another call from an unknown number. It's her, but this time she's asking me to come outside and come see her because she wants to deliver an apology. At this time I was thinking, oh, shall we say, fuck off, though I still went outside to see what the deal was. I open the door, and of course it's incredibly dark. I say into the phone, I'm outside. Come around back. With this, I begin to walk on the snow covered ground in the darkness with my just put on boots. The motion light turns on as I cross the garage in the driveway. The snow masking the ground is tinted yellow by the light. I round the corner of the garage and turn my phone to see. There's a road that runs behind my house and connects to the driveway by bending and I make my way towards the road. The snow crunches beneath my boots as I come ever closer. There's a part in the trees that allows me to walk straight to the road. Otherwise one would have to make his way around the entirety of the driveway, and I reach this part. I ask into the phone, Where are you? In the car. I can see you. I step onto the road, and see her car parked a few dozen feet from me with the lights dimmed. So what's the deal? I just want to talk. Come here. I approach the car and make my way around to the passenger side and I finally see her face. She waves me in and I go ahead and oblige, sitting down in the car. I look at her and she says, Look, I'm sorry. I know I've been a real bitch lately. No, it's okay. I really wasn't good to you and I deserve it. I don't agree, but... Then, of course, she abruptly stops speaking because car lights shine from behind us. Naturally, I assume it's her boyfriend, and by the look on her face... She did too. The car parks behind us, and sure enough, the boyfriend gets out 
and storms over to my side of the car. He yanks on the door handle, and the door swings open and he attempts to grab me, but I grabbed his wrist and got out of the car. What the fuck do you think you're doing with her, huh? We were talking. I was about to leave. Bullshit. You're trying to fucking bang her. Look, I'm trying to sleep. I'm in no mood to do anything. He gave me this look of utter enragement before swinging at me and, of course, missing. A little scuffle ensued, and all that happened was him swearing and eventually slipping and falling before yelling at both of us. I'll fucking kill you! I just stood by her car as she pulled away. She gave me a lift back to the house, and I invited her in, and she obliged. It was late in the night, and I suggested she locks her car if she was going to stay the night, and she again obliged. We slept upstairs in my bed before I awoke hours later. There was a banging at the back door, and I knew this because the back door was directly below my room. She woke up too and said, Oh my god. I stand up quickly and got to my closet and reached behind the coats that I'll never wear and grabbed my Louisville slugger. She was sitting upright in my bed with her hands seemingly embarrassingly covering her eyes. I didn't say anything before walking down the stairs slowly, attempting to be silent. The lights were off and there's no windows on the staircase and the banging on the back door had audibly ceased. I held the bat tightly, making sure it didn't bang into the wall to signal my position at the time. I remember how slowly I stepped down, especially on the bottom three steps which were always the creakiest. Once I reached the last step, I froze, and it still gives me chills to this day. The hardwood floors creak around the bottom of the staircase, and there was a creaking that was growing closer and closer. I raised the bat above my head, ready to slam whoever it was right on the top of the head. The creaking grew closer until I could hear it from my side, and I planned to swing as soon as it was in front of me, as the staircase opened to the left from the bottom coming up. I listened ever so carefully, holding my breath. The creaking came to my northeast and I squeezed my hands tighter than I ever had before around the bat, waiting for it to become just north of me. The creaking grew slower and closer and this time they were directly in front of me and I slammed the bat down hard. I hit something hard and whatever it was crumpled to the floor with a bang and a small flash. I turned on the light. And there he was, the boyfriend. He had shot his gun directly at the floor and left a hole in the hard wood. My ex came down the stairs and was crying profusely, muttering, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, over and over. I called the local police station and four cop cars pulled into my driveway along with an ambulance in a matter of minutes. I sat there at the base of the stairs, watching the boyfriend. He was breathing. I could tell from his chest slowly inclining and declining off the floor. I had grabbed what I think was a 9mm off the floor and kept it in my hand with the safety turned on and I just shook my head over and over in utter disbelief. I explained the situation to the police as the paramedics rushed in and carried him out on a stretcher. All in all, I didn't get to sleep until in the afternoon later that day, after all things had been finished. He ended up actually being induced into a coma and eventually recovered, but a restraining order had already been filed in advance. My ex and I became good friends after the incident, and she never dated that guy again. I never ended up moving, though I had considered it heavily, and nothing since has happened.
Dad mentions the phone calls tapered off while I was away, which was four years, but have started again. One day, I'm at home and I get a phone call around noon. Some guy, I don't recognize his voice, asks for me and I say, Speaking? He proceeds to ask if I remember doing all sorts of sexual acts and describes some stuff before I hang up. I am rattled because I always thought if I could hear his voice I would know who it was. I called the police who came out to take my statement. This was just a year or so before caller ID became available in my city. They told me how to get the call traced next time gave me right that they make the space behind my eyes burn. I squint around to find the bottle opener, which I can't find, so I use the solid edge of a large kitchen knife. It's a risky choice, but the bottle cap is now off the beer and I'm happy. I turn off the alien blinding kitchen light and go to head upstairs but something through the front window of my house that looks onto the street catches my eye. I stop at the bottom of the stairs, and all the hairs on the back of my neck and arms stand up. I turn my head slowly, and my eyes and brain are trying to make sense of what I'm actually looking at. It looks like a rain-drenched woman in a fancy white dress gazing at Number 1. When I was 16 years old, my dad started telling me about the middle of the night phone calls. The caller would get my dad on the line, ask for me, and when he didn't get me he would start telling my dad the rudest, most vile things about me. I didn't know who was calling or why, and I never woke up when the phone rang. I wish I could sleep like that now, so I never spoke with this guy. Fast forward and I'm 22, fresh out of the military, and landed at home for a year while I start college, get a job, and save money. This time I hear the phone ring in the middle of the night. Number 2. So this just happened. A bit of background of the last 25 minutes. I just got home from a reasonably big night. It's 4.30am and stinking hot in this part of Australia right now. I walked in the door and opened the fridge and was so happy to find three icy cold beers in the fridge. I take two of them and walk upstairs to bed to read and drink myself into a boozy sleep. First issue. The beers are not twist tops. They need a bottle opener. And after some sloppy drunken attempts at using the handle of the draw off my bedside table, I head back downstairs to use an actual bottle opener. I turn on the kitchen lights, which are so br- case number. I moved into my own apartment about a year later, got my name listed in the phone book before the internet. This was a big deal. One day, A few months after I moved in, I have a message on my answering machine. Hello. I think you know who this is. Still. Click. I promptly asked for an unlisted number, and I was one of the first people to get residential caller ID in the city of Seattle. But as far as I know, he never called again.